Good morning, once again. It is uh, Tuesday, May the 26th, 2020. I just want to pick up a couple thoughts where we left off yesterday, um, you know, talking about that idea of remaining in Christ and the fact that there are consequences if we choose not to remain in Christ, that there's an accountability that goes along with that, that is affirmed right through the scriptures. Uh, it's not just making a proclamation of faith, but it is living our lives in accordance with what we say we believe about Jesus. Now, yesterday I made a quick reference to Revelation chapter three and the church in Laodicea I want to read that portion here this morning. These and this this again is a revelation, a vision that is given to John of Jesus addressing the needs within the seven churches of Asia that were in existence at that time. Now, Jesus gives some correction uh, to these churches, I mean, five out of the seven, the other two, he just commends for what they're doing. And, uh, but we need to understand that our Lord oversees and looks at our lives as individuals, but also as the body of Christ worldwide. Jesus is evaluating who we are, what we do, according to the fruit that we demonstrate. Let's pick this up in uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, Jesus, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds. He's saying, I know your fruit, what, what you are demonstrating. He said, I know. He can see it. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Exclamation. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. That kind of reminds us of our own society today, does it not? But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. Obviously, Jesus is not talking about money, right? I hope we get that. And white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see spiritual vision, healing. He's talking of white clothes representing stepping away from sin and sinfulness, becoming pure. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Well, that's good news. I mean, if we feel rebuked by the Lord, uh, that's an expression of his love. That's a good thing. So be earnest and repent. Jesus calls the church here to repent of their present stance. And then it goes on to verse 20, that classic verse, which is so misused. It says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. This is often, this verse is often used for unbelievers and addressing unbelievers to come to salvation. The context of that in this passage doesn't fit. The context of this is speaking to the church to the believers, who those who proclaim that they are believers and following Jesus. And Jesus is saying, 
hey, I'm standing on the outside. I'm not a participant in what you were doing. Yeah, I'm standing here, I'm knocking at the door, and I want you to invite me in, and I want you to be a part of who I am, that is, a part of who Jesus is, what Jesus represents, i.e., doing the will of the Father in heaven, and not going about doing the things that they are doing, being totally lukewarm to Christ to God the Father, playing the game. And then Jesus goes on to say to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, again, we do not come to Scripture to interpret it through our emotions, our feelings, what we want to say here, what Jesus, the implications of this for us. This is a challenge for us, too. Uh, scripture has this way of mirroring back to us who we actually are in reality. We may not like it. We may choose to want to reject it. But, however, this is the reality which God speaks into. Now, what is a lukewarm? I mean, he's talking to a church. So it's a lukewarm church that is filled with lukewarm believers because a church becomes what the leadership and the believers within it are. That's the reality. So we've got a bunch of lukewarm believers. What does that mean? Uh, it basically means that it's a church that compromises itself with the world and resembles the surrounding society. It professes following Christ, yet in reality is, Jesus said, spiritually wretched and pitiful. They say one thing, but they do a different thing. They have absorbed the mores and values of the surrounding society. Uh, they have contaminated themselves by accepting things other than what Christ has directed the church to be, the believers to be. We can do the same thing. So easily we can become lukewarm out of the emotional context, oh, let's be loving and kind, which we need to be. That's a reality that we are challenged to be in the scriptures, by challenged by Jesus himself, to be loving, kind, compassionate, but not to the extent of embracing the sinfulness and the values uh, and mores of our society around us. Uh, the Christian, the church, is called to follow the way of Jesus Christ, the way uh, of God the Father. That is what we are called to be. Now, that will set up us apart to be different than our society, meaning that we cannot just accept the way things are in our society and say, well, that is good. That is what God wants. Let us live our lives that way. Instead of living our lives the way God has challenged us to live. In this portion of scripture, I mean, Jesus is very blunt, uh, very straightforward, and he just severely warns the church about his judgment against spiritual lukewarmness. Uh, he says, you can't be that way and follow me. That's what he's saying here. You have to repent. You have to change. You have to recognize the place that you have come to and how that doesn't fit with what Christ wants for his church. Christ sincerely invites this church to repent. He invites us to repent 
and be restored to a place of faith, a place of righteousness, a place of revelation, and a place of fellowship. That's what Jesus' desire is for all churches. Now, I think if we're honest, most churches, we have started to assimilate the ways and the thinking of our society in a fairly significant manner. Uh, many professing Christians today are embracing sexual immorality as the norm. That's not what scripture, that's not what Jesus says we are supposed to do. We are to be separate from the world. We are to be radically different in following Christ. So we are not to embrace these things. We are not to embrace greed. Um, we are not to embrace all of these things that the way the world does them. But we are to stand up. We are to represent Christ. We are to be different. Now, some people will say, oh, that's being judgmental. Uh, you can't say that. That's not politically correct. That's not proper in our society. Will the church standing up for righteousness be judged by the world around it? Absolutely. And we are challenged by the scriptures that that will be a reality. But we are to stand up, nevertheless, and represent God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the truth of the Word of God, and not buy into the world around us, the society around us, which is what Jesus calls being lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, neither totally rejecting uh, God and the way of Christ or uh, just totally buying into it and becoming part of it, but trying to find that middle ground of vacillating around and just being so iffy and ooey and gooey, uh, trying to do the one thing, but really not doing it. Uh, trying to make excuses for ourselves in not standing up for righteousness, godliness, holiness. We cannot afford to do these things. There is an eternal consequence of rejecting Christ and rejecting the will and the way of God, which Jesus brought out in a straightforward manner in Matthew 7, 21. To follow Jesus is to commit ourselves to following the will and the way of God. And if we try and change that, it literally means that we are rejecting Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. And there are eternal consequences to that action as well. Father, give us hearts to follow you through Jesus Christ. Give us the courage. Give us the strength. Give us the love, Lord, for you, first of all, but secondly, for the world around us to stand up and uh, just love you enough and love the world enough that we choose to be different. And we choose to set a different way, a different understanding for the world to see and observe. Sadly, Lord, we need to repent of many things as the church of uh, today, of 2020. Lord, we've embraced and we have assimilated many things that should not be embraced. And Lord, we pray that you will purify our hearts. And Lord, let us walk with you so that you will not be tempted to spit us out of your mouth, to reject us because we refuse to follow you and the way of God the Father and the fulfilling the will of God the Father in this world, in this time in which we live. Help us, Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a good day today. Take care.